I'm Slim Sperling. I'm the discoverer and inventor of a couple of processes which we're going to discuss today and uh, give you a little bit of background on myself. I was born in South Dakota in Aberdeen and my first home there was in Bison. My folks were involved in uh, uh, agriculture, and Dad was a county agent, and our house was just a little tar paper shack out there on the dry flats in Bison, South Dakota. Uh, we moved around a lot during the early years, went from uh, Bison to uh, Elgin, Illinois. Dad had a job with Milwaukee Railroad as an agricultural agent, and then uh, World War II came along. We went from army camp to army camp and uh, spent uh, a couple of years of duration of the war then in central South Dakota with my grandparents on the Missouri River. And I grew up a couple of years there with. Uh, Granddad, who was one of the best hunters in the area, and uh, learned to hunt and fish my entire young life uh, after we moved to Colorado. was devoted to hunting and fishing and being outdoors, uh, learning to know all of the plants and where the animals were. So after my brief uh, career in the Navy, a couple of years on reserve duty, uh, entered forestry school. thought that would be a natural uh, way to express my interest in the, uh, in the outdoors. So my studies were in uh, biology, botany, uh, biochemistry, uh, all of the natural sciences. And while I was there, I was invited, uh, while I was still a sophomore, to take some uh, postgraduate seminar courses in uh, DNA chemistry, which was the new thing in the early 60s. So as time went on, I uh, became more and more disenchanted with the academic and scientific communities. And uh, at the end of my college term at 1966, I turned down a, an offer that came to me uh, to have a uh, master's degree program. Uh, the offer was to find a chemical substance uh, in the fungus world that could be uh, grown like penicillin and produced very cheaply so that it could be put in as an unregistered and unlabeled ingredient in many uh, different uh, foodstuffs. The purpose of this compound specifically, uh, according to the uh, details outlined in the protocols of the master's degree program, was to control the population. This was a substance which would lower the threshold of suggestibility and would perhaps have a side effect of producing a mild euphoria. Now these effects are uh, probably not too alarming uh, until one considers the uh, social and economic and perhaps political considerations. Uh, for the control of the population and the control of the population was exactly the uh, design parameter of this uh, master's degree program. Well, to make a long story short, uh, it took me three days to locate in the literature that substance uh, the fungus that produced it, to grow a culture, to ingest a small amount and test it, find out that indeed 
exactly that effect desired was uh, already known uh, and in the literature, but uh, unknown to the designers of this uh, master's program. Uh, needless to say, I had uh, some ethical and moral considerations there, and I declined uh, to accept the program. Uh, in uh, all honesty, I was extremely disgusted, uh, angry to the point of uh, near explosion. And uh, so I walked out of Colorado State University a very disillusioned and angry young man. Spent the next 20 years uh, teaching myself the art of blacksmithing. Uh, acquired a small shop for a few hundred dollars and began to uh, learn the uh, ancient arts of metalworking. Uh, as it turned out, it was a wonderful exercise in alchemy. The uh, ability to deal with four elements in their various forms and uh, qualities, earth, air, fire, and water. So unbeknownst to me at that time, or not even in my consideration, I began to uh, work with these elements and to create uh, useful and artistic uh, pieces of metal. After 10 years of working uh, solo in my shop and having built it up to a uh, uh, fairly professional level, uh, I opened a school and began to teach the art. And during that time of about five years that the school was open, I had five about five helpers uh, toward the end, and uh, we had a, a very large school. It was the largest blacksmith shop in the United States at that time, uh, in the early and mid-70s. I uh, closed that down in 1980 and uh, took a job on a ranch and then uh, when that uh, proved unsatisfactory I moved down to Denver and uh, was very much a fish out of water. Uh, having been raised in the country and lived my life there, I found the uh, uh, city life to be uh, a bit disconcerting. After about a year, I began to relax into it. Became a little bit more uh, uh, easy with the uh, city life and the hustle and bustle, and began to uh, uh, work out a, a new way of living. Now, let's take a break here. Uh, during my years in Denver. I lived there about seven years. I started a little handyman business and pretty soon had more work than I could do alone. So I called my old friend Bill Reed and uh, asked him if he needed work or could he help. So uh, he came over one morning. We began working together and uh, as we began to get better acquainted, we found out that Bill had a tremendous interest in, in science and some of the more far out, or what we might call fringe science, uh, some of the esoteric things like Tesla and Wilhelm Reich and uh, scientists who were not mainstream but had just made discoveries which became, became famous for. So, we began to experiment uh, evenings uh, doing uh, alchemical work and uh, Bill had had a lifetime interest in alchemy and he was a mining engineer and uh, metallurgist uh, having had his own precious metal refinery at one time. So since I'd been out of the science world and academic world for many, many years, I had to kind of play catch up. And uh, when I began listening to Bill and he was talking about feel this and feel that and uh, different kinds of 
and energies, I was really in the dark. I didn't have a clue. But as we continued to experiment, uh, you know, down in the basement with uh, scrap materials and various kinds of junk that we could uh, pick up in the dumpsters or out in the back alleys, we uh, developed a thing called a caduceus coil based on some reading that we'd done. And uh, that led us into a study of the subtle energies. At that time, I was married to a lady named Diane, who was probably one of the most gifted clairvoyants I've ever known. And uh, she was able to see the energies, uh, see them in color, and detect extremely subtle changes in the uh, energy fields or the beams that were projected from these caduceus coils. So we could begin to correlate uh, different types of coil, different tunings, and uh, with her gift of being able to see the colors, uh, we knew that a certain color would give a certain effect. So we researched in that area for about uh, five years, from 1985 till 1990. And uh, during this time, we also began doing the work with the geopathic zones. Uh, initially, we didn't have a, a good language or definition. But as time went on, we learned about the Hartman grid, uh, geopathic zones being a distinct variety of uh, these negative energies, uh, different than the Hartman grid, different than the Curry grid. But in our researches, uh, the first time out that we did an experiment, we were very fortunate in having a lady who was uh, afflicted with a, a severe migraine headache. Uh, she'd spent thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, going to specialists trying to get rid of this headache. So after a time, uh, we took quite an interest in her case, and uh, by doing various uh, manipulations of the energy field in her home, uh, were able to slightly relieve it for a short time. Then one day we came by the house and decided to uh, uh, douse for negative energy. And we heard about it, but never experienced it or done any dowsing for that particular item. Well, about every 10 feet, uh, going along the side of the house, we'd find this place where the uh, rods would open and there'd be a, a distinct feeling there. Uh, it didn't feel good. So we used a uh, simple technique to remove this uh, negative energy from her home. And since she wasn't home that day, we were <coughs> not able to talk to her. We went back uh, three days later and uh, spoke with her. And she reported that she had a complete absence of a headache on that particular day. And asked her when that had started. And she said, oh, well, three days ago. So I said, well, that's the day we came and removed the geopathic stress from your home. Oh my goodness, she said, I came home that afternoon and my kitchen was crystal clear. Well, what do you mean crystal clear? Well, it had always been fuzzy and gray looking, and now it's just as, as bright and clear as crystal. So, as time has gone on, we've found that we can actually see a difference in an area where the geopathic stress has been removed. And apparently this geopathic stress is a high, highly chaotic type of energy. Uh, you know, anytime you have stress, you're looking at something that's perhaps in a, a sheer force, or there's an out of resonance uh, vibration there. <clears throat> so we've uh, developed this uh, work that we do with geopathic stress. Uh, from that first event 
uh, went on to do about a hundred homes uh, just to certify to ourselves that this simple technique would work for many different people and in different locations. So we finally, after a hundred cases or uh, homes that we'd worked, uh, and seeing the relief that people got, uh, we began to make it into a business and we charge a small fee for this. Uh, this has continued now for, uh, what, 17 years? <laughs> uh, since 1985, no, 12 years. And uh, we've been successful in every case that we've worked. Uh, a few exceptions, but uh, I'd say we have about a 98% success rate in removing geopathic stress and relieving the symptoms of whatever kind a person may be experiencing. And the reports back from the individuals who uh, find beneficial change in their lives uh, usually revolve around the ability to sleep better and be more relaxed and they find that they're more focused and uh, they're their health seems to improve. Well, about 1991, uh, I got into a, a state of bad health myself, uh, nearly died, and by using the newly discovered uh, energy form uh, that was contained in the ring that we embedded, the uh, condition passed very rapidly. Basically, it saved my life. And from that point on, uh, we've researched uh, many, many different areas. We've developed a, a tremendous broad range of understanding, uh, almost unlimited range of application in these tools. Now, the ring was discovered as a pure accident, it was not a conscious thing, but we had been looking for a way to uh, increase the diameter of the beam of energy from our little caduceus coils. We'll break here. Okay. Discovery of the ring led rather naturally then to the development of the AccuVac coil, as we've come to call it. Uh, the first coil was uh, developed just out of pure boredom because I got tired of making rings. And the, uh, how, how would I put that, the, <laughs> uh, the coil was developed uh, based on the same principles as the ring, but using a slightly different geometry. Uh, all of the tools, incidentally, are uh, based on certain measurements found in sacred geometry. Uh, the Egyptian cubit, or 20.6 inches, is our baseline measurement, and that's related to light speed and several other uh, known principles in physics. Uh, that number, uh, 20.6 or 206, uh, shows up in many, many different formulas and standard uh, uh, mathematical derivatives in physics and mathematics. One of the physical constants of the planet or the local universe. Anyway, the, the coil, uh, when we took it to a clairvoyant who could see this energy, uh, seemed to have a, a flow of energy through it. It was drawing in negative energy and putting out positive energy. So with that in mind, uh, my wife Jean came home one evening. I had a very sore neck, uh, something giving her a lot of pain right in this area. I said, here, try the coil, see if that helps. Uh, it's supposed to have a flow of energy through it from, from negative to positive. So 
so she tried the positive side first and found that it made her head a little bit stuffy and then turned the drawing or negative end toward the sore spot begin to pull this energy out of the body. Well, after 45 minutes of that activity, uh, she developed a condition where she had absolutely no pain in the body. And clairvoyantly, uh, one could see the dark energy coming from the area of pain. So this is a development that was unprecedented. We had no idea that this could happen with a, an instrument that had no electrical power, no obvious source of power. But nonetheless, the effect was there. So the following day, she worked on me and took out some pain in my ribs. And uh, I experienced a tremendous relief uh, from discomforts. Uh, the following day, I worked on partner Bill Reed and then uh, again working with uh, different clients uh, uh, to see if our discovery was uh, going to be valuable. And indeed, it turned out that it was. Uh, everyone that we worked with uh, had a significant relief of whatever symptoms seemed to be bothering them at the time. Uh, pain relief seems to be the, the biggest item. So <clears throat> we were a little uh, unsure what this was or uncertain how to proceed except to just keep on doing what we were doing. The design of the coil has changed several times since we initially started and we've added some refinements which seem to increase its effectiveness. Uh, following the coil then we developed the uh, feedback loop which operates exactly on the same principles, but it seems to be a bit more energetic and uh, have a more active effect. Then, uh, uh, in furthering the research, we've uh, gone into uh, development of the harmonizer, which produces now a spherical field, uh, a tube torus, if you will, which uh, affects quite a large area. And this unit will keep the energy in a home stable, uh, office, business, uh, in a barn. Uh, gardens seem to benefit many, many different applications, uh, just like the, the ring has many, many different applications. So this should suffice as a uh, brief introduction of who we are and what we're doing, what our path of discovery has been, and this will then serve as an introduction to the facilitator who is uh, conducting the workshop here today. Uh, would you give us some reports on uh, the effects that you've seen from removing uh, the geopathic stress from uh, different homes? Yeah. Uh, we've had wonderful success with that. In fact, I have a neighbor who had been very, very ill. I uh, thought that perhaps it was about her time to leave the planet because she was so bad she couldn't sleep. And after the geopathic was done, she was up, bright-eyed, running around and sleeping beautifully. Her husband, who they were both are much older, and her husband has been out taking care of his lawn. Uh, doing all sorts of work in his garage. I can't believe it. And he's bright-eyed also. Uh -huh. And I saw her the other day drive off in the car, which she hasn't driven in months and months. For goodness sake. No, in fact, she didn't even care to drive, and off she went. Uh, after the uh, geopathic zones were neutralized, how long did it take for this effect to become apparent? Immediately. Immediately. In that case, yes. Wow. Yeah, immediately. Within... 24 hours, yes, 48 yeah. hours? 24 hours. Oh my goodness. She had called me the next day and told me, and I had spoken with her the day before this had happened, uh -huh. and uh, then that following day it was done, and the next day she called me. Oh, and she goodness. couldn't believe it. Just couldn't believe it. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well.
at some point we'd like to get her on uh, tape and have her story you know, live and color. <laughs> that would be wonderful. And in my own case, I noticed I've always been an insomniac, and I notice that I'm sleeping so much better, Good. Uh, not as restless. I notice that one thing, I don't know whether it was a geopathic or, I, or the harmonizer, but I notice my dust in the house isn't as bad. Not as much dust no, in the house. not as much dust in the house. Oh, for goodness sake. I, that's one I never heard yes. of. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't have to dust as often. So oh, yeah. I have another, um, it was very interesting, it was a triplex. And of course to do the uh, geopathic, we had to go into the whole area there. Mm -hmm. And one lady walked out and said, what are you girls doing? And so uh, the lady who lived in the one in the corner told her what was happening. And she said, oh, gee, that's wonderful, that's exciting. And so the next day the lady came over to see her and said, you know, it's amazing. I've been here about three months and I have been miserable. I don't know what it was, but she said I haven't slept well. And everything has been wrong. And all of a sudden, things have changed. She said last night I had the most beautiful sleep I've ever had. Wonderful. Said, Isn't that amazing? So I'm sure there are other reports too that we haven't you know, found. But I find that the geopathic, uh, I feel that my... Uh, House is happier. <laughs> the house is happier. That that's a good description. <laughs> Have your uh, uh, contacts with other people expanded? Has there been more activity in the uh, communication and the social area? Oh yes, yes. Uh, we had a very interesting thing here. Um, there was one person. I have meetings on Wednesday nights. Uh, there was one person that was um, very negative, and I noticed that the Hartman line went right through where she always sat. And there was an immediate change there. In fact, she wouldn't even sit there, after not knowing what we had done. Right. And she was sat somewhere else, but she has changed completely. So I know it affected her, and now she's telling me that she would like her house done. Oh, <laughs> She's been negative, you know, about all of this. Right. What, uh, what have been your experiences with the uh, the different tools, the ring, the coil, okay. feedback, and, and harmonizing? Well, in the ring, I've been using the small ring. I put it over the nozzle of my uh, my uh, uh, gas when I put the gas in. I've oh. noticed an increase of, I would say on the road, on the highway, about eight miles per gallon increase. Oh yes, it, we had a good chance of that. And I think that it's, um, I haven't complete, completed the in town right now at this moment. I've been very busy, but it was quite low on the regular. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's probably about five miles, uh, at least five oh, miles. Yeah, but more, I'm sure it's more, more mileage. More mileage, on, yeah. Uh, on and that's one and on my hose, uh, with watering my plants and things like that, uh, I've been putting it over my hose. I'd like to put it over my whole system if I could, but unfortunately it's underground. Right. I can't very well do that. But I'll figure out a way. Okay. Because I think that it does restructure the water um, and helps uh, with my plants. They seem to be a little healthier this year. Mm -hmm. Yes, they are. And I haven't fed them as much. Ah. Uh -huh. so, the um, uh, the Acuvac is marvelous for taking out the negative energies. One night we were working with it, and my living room is 27 feet long. And very interestingly, I had my back to the person, and they were pulling energy. I, I had back problems, and that was one of the things that we were working on. And the person kept moving back. And of course, I couldn't see where she was. I said, where do you feel it now? Because she was putting it into different areas. She was clear back in my kitchen. And I could tell her exactly where it was. It seemed to be much stronger uh, the further away that you got. Yes, we, we noticed that effect mm -hmm. uh, with, the first, uh, with the first coil, the first session. Yeah. And uh, people have reported that fairly frequently. So did you get uh, uh, rid of some discomfort there? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. And we had, uh, we 
a lot of times we work on our friends. There was someone here yesterday that had a very badly injured foot, and uh, it, she was worked on, and she couldn't believe it. And she too had been rather negative about this. She thought that something else that she was using would help her, and it didn't. And so I had to come over, and she just bounced right out of here. Well, she's been practically crippled. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Well, we hope that that uh, effect lasts uh, for her and uh, persists over time, and that she has a complete healing on that. Yeah. And we had, I used the rings also around uh, on my water to polarize the water. I use it on my plants, and I use it um, um, under my chair where I sit. In fact, I use uh, two to three rings, under the large rings. Um, I do meditate, and my meditations have been so powerful. I wear my uh, personal harmonizer all the time, and, and of course I was told that we have a protection approximately three feet around us. I was up at uh, uh, Mount Shasta, and we were at a college because there were about 1,500 people ever and, uh, for this uh, celebration they were having. And there was the football, or not the football, but the baseball game practice was going on, which was near the parking lot, but not really close. As I was leading over to open up my trunk to get some things out of the trunk, and my friend was standing very close by, a ball came and it hit, right, it came right between us, and it hit my trunk and dented my steel trunk. Oh, for goodness sake. And it was, of course, we, I thought I heard someone say, watch out, but you know, you don't think about any, yeah. you know, that somebody's gonna hit you in the head with a ball. But uh, they were frightened, they were very frightened. Oh. That, uh, thought that maybe it had hit us. And I didn't realize what had happened to my trunk <laughs> until later. <laughs> Which I haven't had things yet. But the, uh, I do feel that uh, we both were protected. We both had on our, our harmonizers, you know. And you, you feel that that energy diverted that uh, ball from coming absolutely. and hitting either one? Yes. And every time I go out in public, I wear this. I wear it around the house too at times. But I definitely do it when I go out in public. Wonderful. You know, I, I feel very secure in this. And my harmonizer that I have in the house, uh, it gives out so much energy, and I've had I've noticed that um, uh, the, the pollution seems to be uh, has left. <laughs> <laughs> no, it no, no, air, no air pollution. No air pollution in, around in here. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And I think that the, I really feel it has a lot to do with it. Skies are a little brighter. Much brighter. It's right now. It's very bright. Have you, have you noticed more birds coming into the yard? Oh yes, I have loads of birds. And loads of birds. Is that yeah. a change from March when we neutralized the geopathic zones? And, uh, we got, uh, well, I've always had birds, but I seem to have more right now. Have more? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. I've always been some birds, particularly since I got rid of, you know, not got rid of my cats, but my cats left, <laughs> you know, left the planet, you know. But no, they were around some of them, but now, uh, there are a lot of birds, and uh, uh, it's it's delightful. Wonderful. And the weather has been wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's been lovely here. I uh, think you now the um, the loop uh, we've worked with that. We had a friend that's up in Los Angeles that had been very ill and was in a lot of pain. We went up there and we did her house which was amazing because uh, she lives in a condo. You took out the geopathic stress Oh, we there. certainly did. And we could feel the difference immediately, yeah. immediately. And we worked, uh, the Hartman lines went right through her bed and she was having a lot of lung problems wow. uh, and a lot of pain. And we were working with her, gave her a treatment and used those. And she slept that night for the first time in her bed. She's been getting up and sleeping in the chair, uh. and partially. And today, um, let's see, it's about a month later. I can't believe the change in her. She just kind of come back to life. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> oh, that, that's wonderful. Yes. To hear. And she was given a wonderful treatment, and uh, my friend who was very good at doing the treatments.
Mm -hmm. the game. We both uh, participated, but she was uh, the one that did predominantly the most of the treatment. Mm -hmm. And we've had marvelous results. Uh, I didn't you know, do this, but uh, some of my friends that were in this workshop did a six-story building. Wow. <laughs> That was quite interesting. Re relief was had there too. I imagine so. Uh, it's a little difficult to find out too much there mm -hmm. because it's um, uh, it's not a convalescent home, but it is uh, a low housing for the elderly, and okay. there are a lot of people that are not well in there. Oh, so absolutely. We're trying to find out. But a couple of people I know that live there uh, look pretty good. Good. Has <laughs> yeah. there been a change? Yes, I'm sure there has. That's yeah. great. Uh -huh. Uh, uh, let's see, um, there seems to be, there's so, there's so many people that we have been doing, we, oh we did, uh, we went up north into Oregon and we did four houses up there. We had wonderful results and everyone was uh, excited about it. Very, and very positive mm -hmm. results. Very yeah. positive results. Yeah. And I know they had had some illnesses before, and we found a lot of the Harmon line that went through. Mm -hmm. This was a very difficult place to do because there was so much rock. Oh, so we I've, I've heard that about her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. We were excited about doing that, and so were they. Well, and thank you, Dorothy, and we'll uh, uh, wait to hear more from down the line here, down from somewhere in the future. We'll have more reports and be able to get uh, some specific details on what's happened in people's lives. Thank you very much. I did the bupathic work and uh, just some of the stories that I like to tell that might not come up in the uh, talk on Sunday on the, the tools, their discovery, and that type of thing. So I'll just introduce some of the applications and some of the results that we've had that would have pertinence uh, to different individuals here in the group tonight. Uh, I'll do some scribbling on the board and a lot of hand waving and arm waving. and. Uh, probably will cover uh, the particulars that would not ordinarily come up uh, during a workshop. And this is just by way of an introduction. Uh, I'll give you some of the highlights of things we've experienced in, in both areas of the subtle energy work. And I want to, uh, while I'm talking, have uh, each of you experience the effects of this gold silk that Bill Reed has produced and his wife is now uh, turning into a certain article in the clothing. Uh, over the next couple of days, we'll just keep circulating that for those that are interested and would want to experience it on a, on a very personal level. So, the other thing I want to do is to introduce Cynthia's uh, glass work. I've seen a piece and I was just absolutely charmed beyond belief. <laughs> the, uh, the piece was very powerful and uh, being a craftsman myself, uh, not as a fine craftsman as Cynthia, but uh, coming from an artistic background of about 20 years of hammering iron, uh, I can appreciate the, the very fine and delicate work that's done here, uh, particularly the accuracy. I, w I was a, a very crude blacksmith. Uh, the, you know, the hinges and the doorknobs, that's my style of artwork. <laughs> And that's the kind of thing I did for a number of years. So uh, with that, I'd like to have Cynthia make a brief presentation here, uh, show the piece that she brought, and uh, uh, 
I don't know if you want to paint. Crystal pattern on this piece of glass. All sides are high polished, and so the energy is going front and back, and also shooting out. And, and um, this glass is called Starfire. So appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned about the the other one, the other half glass you did. And the other glass that I use is a, it has a greener tint. Um, <coughs> it's just as nice. I don't know what else to say. Mm -hmm. Oh, that you usually, um. uh, This texture here, what you're seeing is just a, what we call hand lapping with a silicon carbide grid. It's the same stuff that you use for sandblasting. Um, this panel, it was supposed to go to Boston um, as a presentation for Mormon Temple. And we're pending an estimate bid to put six huge Flower of Life panels in a Mormon Temple. Wow. <laughs> we don't know if it'll go through. That'll change the grid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, on the other panels that I do, since this was for a sample, I didn't hand texture. But what you see is, you saw that on Anne's, is that every inch is worked where it's totally spinning, constantly spinning, every inch. Um, it just has life when I texture. But what you're seeing is just straight. To show the cuts, but it is wheel cut traditionally with a lathe, and it took me. It takes me about three to five days per panel, um, working three hours nonstop, putting it down and <sighs> processing <laughs> through the night and going back. Um, when it's finally completed, it usually takes me about two to three days to adjust mm -hmm. because the energy that's running. <coughs> the dining room table is at an angle where the panel itself is aimed where we sleep. And I have two Siamese cats, and I put the large rings on the floor, and they just roll. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they, they're very high energized cats because of the energy that we run. And that's just from just being there. Yeah, I was being prepared for this. Mm -hmm. And before I started this panel or received the, seeing the panel, I didn't cut any glass for six months. Mm -hmm. I couldn't touch glass. I couldn't go to the studio, um, the labor intensive, I couldn't do any of that. And after six months <coughs> in January, um, I reached for a big thick piece of glass and started drawing and cutting on it. And usually, after all that time of not working labor intensively, I hurt. Well, during the panel, not one bit. Not one bit. So, but I use the panels on a regular line, these two, enhancing with his brains. I'll vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, because Robin's received I'm working it big. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Who lucky you? Lucky you. <laughs> there you have it to, to you. Well, An experience. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. And if you'd like, excuse me, if you'd like, um, it can be here every day while yes. the workshop's taking place. All right. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> So how do you find it? How do you find it? Excuse me? How do you find it? What well, I should all? probably start with the two events that uh, got me on the path of healing myself. Uh, on the path of discovery, as it were, and were things that I 
had no precedent for. There was no precedent in my experience, and the results were uh, phenomenal, to say the least. They were beyond anything I might have expected. And give a lot of credence to uh, some of the metaphysical things I've heard about or was beginning to hear about. And also uh, take us back into history, uh, perhaps even thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And I'll, I'll try to introduce that more historical concept uh, after I've laid out the first scenario where I, I use dowsing and the quote acupuncture technique that I'm currently using for uh, diverting the grid energies away from the home or business. Uh, I'm going to try to give you a, a little bit of an idea. Some of you have been to Denver. <coughs> And on the west uh, side of Denver is, uh, of course, the mountains. And as you approach that area, you're always impressed with these uh, hogback <coughs> mountains. Uh, they're, they're just a narrow lip edge like this that uh, come up and run oh, a mile or two in length, and then a creek will come winding down uh, through them. So my old time home there uh, since 46 was right on Bear Creek, uh, just east of the mountains. We had a you know, several acre property in here, I had 60 acres. And I lived right on Bear Creek. Make that blue look like a river. <coughs> and uh, along the uh, bottom of the hogbacks ran a county road, uh, starting in here and kind of running fairly straight along there. There were a couple of uh, natural lakes uh, called the Soda Lakes, which had uh, <coughs> rather uh, interesting history. The early pioneers used to boil the water, uh, boil it down pretty dry and recover soda ash uh, for washing clothes and help them clean, clean up their uh, traveling gear. And it was an old Indian campground uh, on both sides of the creek. Uh, you know, high stream banks there cut through by the streams. And I lived there for about 35 years total. I called it home. In the year that I was to leave that area, in 1980, uh, we suddenly began uh, noticing a number of accidents that would occur right about this location on the road. Every car hit exactly the same spot. If you'd driven a stake in there, everyone would hit a stake. <coughs> I'm curious about that. I mean, how come all of a sudden we have all these accidents? So I've been reading a, a little book by Harvey Howells called Dowsing for Everyone. And it's written up in the bibliography that I have in the workbook that you'll have tomorrow. Anyway, uh, in there they described uh, geopathic zones, or zones of noxious energy was the term they used. So along in the book, uh, one of the stories was about the dowsers using uh, different means to block these energy zones and you know, bring about improvements in health or sleeping patterns 
And uh, one of the stories involved blocking a zone outside of a, an intersection where there had been a high number of accidents. So I thought, well, I wonder if these accidents are caused by geopathic stress. So I went down along the road here and down for about a half a mile. And right at this location, I found a, a stream crossing that went into the small lake here. And I knew there was a little spring up on the hillside, kind of a marshy area. And suspected that there might be a, a crack or a fissure uh, deep in the earth. And the stream pretty much followed that, uh, that water course. So at that point, uh, I took a couple of uh, rods once I located it and since I was standing right on the spot where the <coughs> rods had opened, just like so, I thought, well, maybe these will work. Let's see if I can block that energy from crossing the road, if, you know, if that's what's causing the problem. So I knelt down and I just stuck them into the ground and shoved the handles down uh, just a couple of feet off the road in, in the bark yet in the grass there. So we'd gone from a historical uh, accident rate of maybe one or two a year at this location, uh, steadily climbing from Maybe at that time we were having maybe one every two or three months. Uh, if we graph this and show the historical trend, uh, we'd see a curve of you know one or two a year, finally up to maybe one or two a month in in later times as traffic increased and they paved the road and so on and so on. And in 79, this curve suddenly went like this, up to 20 a day. I mean, it was carnage. Well, that coincided with the grand alignment of the planets in May of 80. So, to make a, a long story short, this accident rate from the time I blocked this, uh, as far as I know to the present time, went straight down to zero on the line. You know, we had a, a spike and then a zero and it didn't return to its historic normal as long as I was in that area. And I, as I drive past that area modernly, you know, 15 years later, I don't see any evidence of accidents in that, in that particular area. Of course, it's a four-lane highway. But, you know, this to me was unbelievable. I, I mean, I was, you know, I had no precedent total left brain at the time, I'm saying, okay, you know, we have a series of accidents that happen every day, the helicopters and the sirens are overhead. Uh, this is not possible. So, as I left my old home ground, uh, a lot of my paradigm shifted. You know, I, I left the country, moved into the city, and I mean, I'm a fish out of water. I didn't know what to do with this. Uh, no job history, no <laughs> uh, marketable skill in, in the you know, Denver job market. <coughs> and uh, about that time, I began getting into the metaphysical side of things. I married a clairvoyant lady, and. She had a library full of 
metaphysical books that she never read. She didn't need it. She just looked, saw it. So she tutored me for seven years and brought me a little more up to speed on what metaphysics is and how it works. <coughs> and then we had park companies so that I'd have uh, a quiet alone time to uh, get in and define all the terms and begin to study and practice and you know see if all this stuff really worked. So between uh, 1981 when we married and uh, uh, 89 and 90 I was in that mode of learning <coughs> a new language, a new um, way of understanding things, and beginning to see the reality of, as our American Indian people say, the, the real world behind this one. Uh, finding out what prayer is, how it works, and that everything I said or thought or uh, did was a form of prayer. And made some major changes in my life. Well, about that same time, uh, Bill Reed and I began working together, and he was an old metaphysor from many, many years back. <laughs> and <coughs> Also, a you know, physical scientist and a very left brain approach to uh, physics and chemistry and that type of thing, but still interested in alchemy, but trying to bring it about through you know, totally physical means. And we began to research the uh, intricacies of alchemy and, uh, as I mentioned, the Wilhelm Reich data of which I had read some back in the early 60s and had built a couple of uh, cloud busters myself and used them, found them effective, and then found that you didn't need a cloud buster to do the same, same job. You could do it by throwing energy out through a hand or uh, just visioning the energy going out. And between 81 and uh, 89, I did a lot of practice in that area, uh, much to the astonishment of some of the local weathermen, <laughs> as well as myself. Uh, I was riding a tractor one morning up in northern Colorado, and I was doing some ranch work, and uh, the wind began to blow out of the Laramie area. And I noticed kind of a gray, fuzzy, not a cloud bank, but coming with that wind from Laramie was this blackish uh, stuff floating in the air. And I, I didn't need the wind to come up and blow my corn stalks off to the next county, so I began throwing energy at it. I did that every time I head north on the tractor. <coughs> and I did that probably eight or ten rounds of the field. And then forgot about it. Well, at the time I noticed the wind start, I was also listening to the KOA weather reports, the farm reports. And the announcer was saying, Well boys, you gotta get your baby calves in and uh, make sure you got plenty of hay in the barn and everything in out of the pasture. Because we're going to have a weather, a winter storm that is going to be as bad as anything we've ever seen. Huge storm coming out of Laramie. Uh, okay, well that must be the wind I'm seeing and this gray stuff. And I wonder if the gray stuff was associated with it. I didn't know what it was at the time. So uh, the morning passed and the noon farm report came on and the same announcer comes on the radio and he says, 
boys, you're not going to believe this. That storm vanished. <laughs> it's gone. And they couldn't explain it. And I'm sitting here on the track and scratching my head and saying, wow, this stuff really works. <laughs> Whatever it is. I knew the feelings, I knew the, the flow of the energy and the ability to do that. And so I spent uh, a year and a half playing with cloud patterns and weather and tornadoes and nasty looking thunderstorms and that kind of thing. But I couldn't teach anybody to do it. You know, and they looked at me like I was totally out of my tree. And matter of fact, the boss told me not to even talk about it. You know, the neighbors were beginning to <laughs> talk. I could care less. You know, hell, if you all have rain, you need to raise hay. What, what else do you have to be concerned about? So, at that time, uh, Bill and I began to be better acquainted and we went to a psychotronics conference uh, down the Golden. I know the 23rd annual or something. And I, I felt totally like a fish out of water, you know, seeing guys like Tom Bearden and, um, well, I can't remember all the names now, but, you know, grand old folks in <coughs> psychotronics and subtle energy work and esoteric things that I couldn't even pronounce. But I made a vow that day as I walked in that I would understand it at some point. That I'd come along and, and I'd study and try to figure this stuff out. And <clears throat> in the middle of that, uh, long late in the program, uh, Ralph Bloom walked in with his uh, room book. It was just freshly published. And I think some of you may have seen the, the rooms and worked with them a little bit. So he set up his little card table and a folding chair and uh, set out a couple of dozen books. I finally got curious enough and got enough gumption up to walk out and start talking to him. And uh, I said, here, try it. He's got a <coughs> purple sack of stuff and reach in and pull out the room. So what I drew was this I guess it, it's been ever since we've been on that path of the spiritual warrior. <laughs> Drawing the, uh, that room to begin with kind of uh, backed me up a little bit and really set me back on my heels. Because I didn't know the full implications of that at the time. But after what, that was 82, 92, 15 years later. Uh, we're out here on the cutting edge of technology. I've been given a lot of gifts, a lot of opportunity. And the greatest opportunity to this point is the opportunity to speak to this group this evening. A lot of high-powered folks here, and I recognize that, and I really appreciate it. Very, very impressed with who I've met here this evening and the, the strengths of this this group and the backgrounds that you all have. So thank you for coming and uh, listening to an old hillbilly mm -hmm. talk about some things that have happened in his life. Well, as Bill and I began to work together, we came to a, we were called to the ladies' home to do some 
house repairs, and I worked for her previously, and found her to be quite a delightful person. A young blonde woman, early 30s, and uh, obviously fairly well to do, <coughs> living in a nice district and a very nice home. And uh, when I'd been there before, she just treated me wonderfully well, and you know, had stopped for coffee and fixed some fruit and cake. And, not, not the usual thing when you're, you know, raking leaves and hauling trash and trimming trees. So, we got to the door on this second call, and she met us, and her face was kind of pinched in, and she didn't look like the same person I remembered. Didn't have the same aura about her, same attitude. And she was a bit crabby, and, and Bill says, Hey, I don't want to work for you. Let's get out of here. I said, hey, wait a minute. That's not the same person that I know. Let's find out more about this. As time went on, we found that uh, uh, she had gotten a migraine headache the day she moved in the house. And she had a migraine headache for three years continuously. She'd been over half the planet, spent over $40,000 trying to get rid of this headache, find a specialist who could help her. And uh, nobody had. So we thought, well, let's try, you know, let's ground her gutters, make sure the electricity is flowing the right direction in the house, and do a couple other things. We, we found that her furnace was uh, out of adjustment, producing low carbon monoxide. And uh, well, we made a slight change for her over a period of a couple of weeks. We were going by one day, and I said, Bill, let's, let's check and see if this geopathic stress is, is all that it's cracked up to be. Let's see if that's her problem. Because I was remembering the uh, high accident corner down there on the county road. So. Just on the spur of the moment, we wheeled into her drive and knocked on the door. She wasn't home. Uh, got out the dowsing rods and went and checked around the house. Sure enough, there, about every 10 feet, there's a geopathic or negative energy line. So we, we used a little different technique uh, than we currently use, but it worked. And being she wasn't home, uh, I called her three days later and asked her what her, how she was feeling. And she said, well, I don't have a headache today. Mm -hmm. Well, when did that start? Well, three days ago. I said, well, Bill and I came by and we stopped and moved the geopathic zones that we found there. And that happened about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. She said, well, I got home at 4, and my house was crystal clear. <laughs> this dark, heavy energy had completely vanished. And she was actually able to see the difference. And she said, I woke up the next morning totally without pain for the first time in three years. So that was where we started, and the first incidents and the lead into uh, the conversations that we'll have tomorrow and the demonstration and the hands-on experience of dowsing for geopathic stress. Uh, removing geopathic stress from a home or a business, uh, we found the usual thing that happens is that people have more energy. Initially, they may feel so tired that they just go crash for 24 or 48 hours. As the stress is relieved, they just kind of let their breath out and uh, report that they really need to go to sleep and just relax. And the reason for that is that Geopathic stress affects the level of adrenaline in the kidneys. 
and you have a constant irritation, a constant pressure, a constant adrenaline rush that you're not even quite aware of. And one of the symptoms of geopathic stress after a very long term is adrenal exhaustion. So if any of your practitioners and your clients are exhibiting signs of adrenal exhaustion, uh, be sure you have somebody, uh, a practitioner, who can go out in the field and do the geopathic work for them and recommend that. Uh, another symptom you'll find is the, the roller coaster effects that come in you know, right here at the bottom of the pit and your practice brings them up to a high and then when they leave and go back home they're down the pit again in about a week. Okay, knock out the geopathic stress and they'll come up here and they'll plateau. They go on at a newer, higher level. Uh, headaches, uh, tumors, cancers, by the way, are a disease of location. Cancer always occurs in the location where two of these zones cross in the bed. If it's in the upper body, it'll be in the throat, in the upper <coughs> tissue, in the lungs. Uh, you'll see cancers on the legs and the feet, anywhere in the world but they'll always be right on those crossings. Uh, the Hartman brothers, a couple of doctors out of Germany, uh, did a study on this uh, back in the 40s, I think, and uh, they documented 5,000 cases. 98% correlation with the crossing of geopathic stress with the occurrence of cancer. We've all heard of cancer houses where generation after generation after generation of a family or succeeding owners will have cancer. It's due to the particular energy in that house and the oddity that everybody parks their bed in exactly the same place in the room and the guy sleeping on that side of the bed gets cancer and the one on that side doesn't. That's the simple reason. And the reason is it's a one inch wide band of energy that crosses the bed. And where two of those intersect and cross, that's where you'll have cancer. It brings on all of the other degenerative diseases. And we've seen everything from MS to cancer to chronic fatigue syndrome to to da 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 da, all resolve, all go away after doing geopathic stress work, knocking out, neutralizing these zones. So I can comfortably say that geopathic stress is at the root of every known ailment, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual. Geopathic stress is a major contributor to those <coughs> various conditions. Do you have a question, Larry? Uh, well, what I was thinking is, uh, it sounds like you're talking about me. What I was just thinking <laughs> is that I have kidney problems and it's related to varicose veins. And it sounds like <laughs> I, I must have a heart and lines cross in some place in my area. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, the geopathic zones <coughs> resistance interferes with the immune system so that we pick up chronic uh, conditions, virus, bacteria, fungus, other parasites. Uh, I lump parasites into that, those specific classes, the whole range of organisms that commonly inhabit our bodies and, and finally get to the majority, in other words, they finally take over and down we go. So, uh, I'm going to bring in here uh, a thought that I had this morning. I was talking, to, or yesterday I guess, when I was talking to Dorothy, uh, in scriptures you remember 
somewhere in there, and somebody may know exactly where it is. Uh, old Lucifer's talking, and he says, I will cast a net upon the whole earth. I will trap and snare this, this whole earth. It could be that the Hartman grid and the geopathic zones are that net because they are defined as chaos zones. They introduce chaos into otherwise orderly and organized systems. Our bodies are basically very organized and orderly systems, created obviously by the one being. So, if indeed that be true, we found a way at least to lift a portion of that net so it doesn't doesn't bother us. <coughs> and it's real simple, as you'll discover tomorrow. Uh, These rods can only be put outside or inside. Uh, Preferably outside, but then <coughs> they can be put inside. And we, we'll use the both the uh, thousand rods, uh, like acupuncture needles, or we can use this uh, device we call a an omega coil. Greek symbol omega means resistance, and it does resist uh, the flow of these energies. Yeah, if we have a, a geopathic zone entering in this direction, you place the open legs like so. The uh, Some of the interesting things we've observed after the geopathics are, are neutralized is the bird life seems to increase in the area. Uh, even in a small yard, it seemed like all of a sudden the, the backyard is full of birds and they love to come in and be in that space. Other creatures as well. Uh, sometimes uh, you know, squirrels, raccoons, and other things will come into the area. Uh, ants, on the other hand, tend to disappear after neutralize the geopathics. Uh, we've seen uh, quite a number of cases, and this was, I think, probably the, the best recommendation I had on that, and one of the nicest reports uh, came from the wife of the president of the Exxon Corporation in Dallas. We had the opportunity to do that home for them. And uh, the purpose of it was to relieve some stresses that he was undergoing. And that resolved, but uh, when her uh, exterminator came to check the house in the spring, why, uh, he couldn't find any cockroaches or ants, and he, said, gee, I'm sorry, but I, I can't charge you for my services. <laughs> um, of interest uh, to you, Lola, would be the fact that uh, partner Bill Reed went to a, a jazz concert one night, and he quick doused the concert hall and you know, after they started uh, just a practice early in the afternoon and he got acquainted with the piano player and the guy said to me, I can't make this thing work right. It doesn't, this piano isn't right for some reason and he was also a piano tuner so he got in there and he tuned on it a while. Couldn't make the thing sound just the way he wanted it. So Bill said, wait a minute, let's, let's check something. <coughs> and he got his dowsing rods and uh, checked, and there was a geopathic zone going right across the piano. 
silly uh, took an Omega coil and taped it to the wall there so that it didn't go and then he checked a few more, especially where the group would have been uh, working. And the musicians normally could, uh, you know, say they play for an hour uh, at, a, at a sitting. They played for three and a half hours without a break. <laughs> they felt wonderful. And they said it was the best performance they had ever given mm -hmm. as a group. And incidentally, the piano sounded the best that it could possibly <laughs> sound. So these uh, geopathic zones introduce a <coughs> dissonance, if you will, into the environment. And it can actually affect you know, physical stuff like steel piano strings and guitar strings and that type of thing, as well as the quality of the voice uh, coming uh, to the microphone. Uh, there's a couple more items in the area of music and sound resonance that I'll get into regarding the rings uh, on Sunday. But uh, just be aware that. Uh, the, the voice, when projected uh, through a ring, uh, it, it makes quite a difference in the way my voice would sound to you out, out there in the back room. Mm -hmm. Did you pick up the difference? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> it works. <laughs> When the energy is neutralized, does it scatter or does it vector in different directions? When you throw a rock in the river, it doesn't interrupt the flow of the river except where the rock is. It just goes up and over. And in this case, the energy uh, continues on its same path, but it's diverted up and over the dwelling uh, for a distance of several hundred feet up. And several hundred feet downstream. I'd like to ask you a similar question like that, too. I've got these powerful magnets at home. I was using them one night playing with them, and I had this harmonic uh, harmonizer, personal harmonizer on. That won't hurt hurt the harmonizer, then. This another medallion, any energy will not hurt it, then. It, it's programmed to where to keep its energy intact and resonate with it, uh, coordinate with it, then, right? Yeah, by the nature of the materials by the nature of the structure itself. Uh, it, it's what we'd call a fixed field, in a sense, mm -hmm. or a fixed frequency, but it contains a multiple pattern of frequencies. So it would be a, a natural pattern of frequency and uh, <coughs> resonance, which is essentially unvaried. I mean, it, it does have a, a variance by its own nature. It, it fluctuates. But it's in direct accordance with the principles of the sacred geometric resonances. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect, like the Pekian energy little circles, it wouldn't affect those. It, uh, I mean, I know it won't be affected now. You told me that. But would it affect, like, the, the patronized energy or anything like that? Adversely, <coughs> tachyon energy. Uh huh. No, they they, they wouldn't interfere. I don't believe with one another or well, one or the other. Okay. Because one a storm of the tachyonized energy is is another type. I think. Uh, well, uh, the tachyon energy is identical to what comes off the ring, oh, okay. uh, with the exception that we have measured the energy beam from the ring. Uh, 10 miles from the ring up, up this way. So we, we actually have that instrumental measurement. Can I ask about uh, the Omega ring? How long do you leave it on, on the line? Uh, those are permanent. Yeah, they go in permanently. Okay. Hmm. And it looks like that's pretty easy, right? It's really simple. <laughs> it's really simple. Is it one to be the same size? And it's really cheap. 
Uh, the preferred size is that size, yeah. Is that the same size as the medium size ring? Uh, yeah, it's uh, one cubic length, 20.6 inches. 18 inches will work, but 20.6 is a preferred. And fairly, fairly heavy gauge copper, 12 gauge or 12 gauge copper. And it doesn't look like the configuration is particularly precise. No, no, you just wrap it on the coffee can and bend the legs back and you got it. <laughs> scrap wire, you know, bucket down to the salvage yard. You know, it's really cheap. As long as it's copper. Yeah, and it can be bare or insulated. No. Uh, what gauge do you say is 14? 12 or 14. Uh, yeah, the, the 12 gauge will probably last nearly 100 years. Get the 14 gauge. We'll, we'll probably live longer, so we'll have to replace it. Um, just for curiosity's <coughs> sake, during this particular um, material, when you are talking about that straight rise, that hypothetic chaos and energy, that, that chaotic energy cannot be transformed, has to be blocked? Uh, at present, yeah, we can transform it, but at, at present this is the, the simplest, most direct and cheapest way to do that. There's no reason to transform it. Yeah, uh, there is a... Uh, machine, I'm going to call it a machine generated program that maintains this grid structure on the planet, mm -hmm. as far as we can tell. Uh, we say they're natural, but I think it's a machine generated uh, <coughs> geometric pattern that's being projected onto the Earth, uh, probably from off the planet somewhere. And, you know, it's been around a long time, a really long time. Uh, I don't know how old Lucifer is, but uh, uh, yes. he's been around a while, <coughs> at least for recorded history, which is, what, 10,000 years or so. Slim, uh, I would like to briefly uh, talk about the Marlene, the person that had the uh, of breast cancer and had the cancer removed and 16 years later she found out she had lung cancer and another person, some of our uh, went up to Los Angeles and did the geopathic on her condo and the Hartman line right through the bed this way and this way mm -hmm. and she was dying and so uh, I had talked to Slam and he gave me some from the famous seller and we worked on it with some of the tools and then about a week and a half later uh, on my way up to Oregon we stopped and she was really bad. I mean, uh, terrible. Uh, I think she was detoxing or something like that. Now it's just unbelievable. Her energy has come back. She can sleep for the first time. She was not sleeping. Uh, she could only sleep in her chair downstairs, not up there. Mm -hmm. And we used that tornado right in back of her bed. <coughs> and um, then, of course, and, um, and it's just it's just a miracle what's happening to her. She sounds like her old self. <laughs> Is, does the gauge of the copper uh, heighten the ellipse? Uh, Probably up to a point, uh, 12 gauge uh, seems to be a very convenient and fairly common item in the scrap yards, salvage yards, uh, wherever they collect metals. You can generally go in there and go around in the bins or ask them for some uh, scrap materials. When they're tearing, up, tearing down buildings, uh, quite often the you know, salvage crew goes in and, and pulls all the old wire and just rolls it up. And you can buy that for somewhere in the neighborhood of a buck pound. We have wires that place. Yeah, well you just need the, the 
What, um, what, if you had a 12 story building and you wanted to interrupt the, the grid, would you need a larger gauge to, to make the energy look like No. No, no this, this is entirely added. Yeah, we've done, I think, up to the 30th floor, done it from outside on a high rise apartment. It's more convenient, perhaps, to uh, just use the Omega coil in the, you know, in an apartment. Uh, not real pretty to have taped on the wall, but if you can tuck them under the rug or behind furniture or something, it'll work. And I'll, I'll guarantee you, you'll be so charmed with the results that ugly doesn't matter. Conversation. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I had a question right there. Uh, you, you don't put it in the ground then where the energy is coming. You put it on the floor where it's coming up like this? or uh, I see why it's going... Yeah, the, these zones are, okay. are like vertical mirrors. <coughs> I mean, they're, they're a plane mm -hmm. of energy. And they, they have a direction of flow like a river. But it, it's only an inch wide. The zone is only an inch wide. And you locate it with those... Uh, L rods, and then you put the right. horseshoe rod over them to counteract them. Then. Yeah, you on just the floor or wherever. Yeah, it, and like you it. can lay it flat on the floor or you know up against the wall either way. If it, energy's coming this way, you just this way. But it's so always it, going straight up. Then. Well, this this energy, we say it comes up out of the ground. I'm not sure that's entirely true. But we know that we can block it in this fashion. I mean, we know they have a direction. They, they do have a flow, uh, like a slow-moving river. Well, it may be coming from a planet over to this way, too. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, who, who knows? Yeah. It's just part of, the, it's part of the grid. And as you get more into the sacred geometry, you start visualizing the, uh, the patterns of sacred geometry in three dimensions, uh, it gets a lot more clear, and your, your perceptions clear up on that whole thing. But it, initially, if you just visualize it as a kind of a neon glow of energy, uh, like the aurora borealis, which you know, snakes around up there in the north country, uh, that's, that's what it would look like here. Thank goodness I've, I've been with a couple of excellent clairvoyants. One was my wife and the other is my youngest son. You can, you can see this. So I, I've learned a tremendous amount. You know, I, I'm out here shooting the mouth about it, but these guys know. And they don't talk about it. So. Slim, I'm, I know you're going to spend a whole day on this tomorrow and some people came specifically to be able to hear what you're going to talk about with the World Pollution Project tonight. Can you give us a brief <coughs> on what's going on with that? Yeah. Uh, to get on into the concept of some active energy work, uh, I'll just I'll illustrate the ring because that that's the, the prime discovery. Uh, we have a ring with a bead on it, which is just an amplifier. And if we turn this on edge, flip it this way and illustrate it this way, then we have an energy field uh, across the plane of the ring. And we'll, the light's getting about right here, we can turn the lights out will actually be able to see that plane of the ring. But it also extends to the clairvoyance vision in both directions from this center plane. And it extends in a cylindrical beam. Like say we measured that 10 miles long and it probably extends way beyond that. Uh, I'd like to do a shot from Pike's Peak up to Golden and see if we can measure. I uh, just haven't had uh, time to get that done in the last five years. 
but uh, in brief then uh, you can convert a cylinder into a sphere by intersecting uh, three rings uh, this fashion and then create a toroid field and toroid simply means that the energy comes from the top circles around this way and comes back in the bottom. Okay, it's like an apple. It's got a simple core and the energy field is, is in motion. It's actually a rotating field. Uh, those of you familiar with Flower of Life, it would be the two torus type of field. Uh, positive at the top and drawing in negative energy at the bottom, converting it back to positive. So that's the magic of the, of the harmonizer. <coughs> and after we, the, the, matter of fact, the same day that we discovered the uh, energy beam had a minimum length of 10 miles and could be measured, uh, <coughs> Bob took his scanner and recorded the frequencies of molecular water in the cloud where I was <coughs> in the ring on the cloud above his lab, I uh, made a recording of that and when he played it back on audio, uh, <coughs> he noticed that uh, the room got real fresh and clean. It smelled like ozone in the room, he said. In all the frequency work and experimental work he'd done, he'd never experienced anything like it. I said, hey, let's uh, let's make that into a sonic air cleaner. You know, we've got a product. We can make tapes and have an air freshener. <laughs> well, it, it sounded horrendous. I mean, it sounded like a fly stuck in a spider web. <laughs> but it works. You know. So then I took uh, a copy of the tape and played it through uh, a little boombox uh, cassette player. Uh, to the harmonizer, which I sat about 18 inches in front of the speakers. And Bob noticed that the air in his area, you know, when I was doing it at my house, 10 miles from where he was, he could feel the energy field expand past him. And the same effect occurred in his lab, occurred in my house, and also in the entire local environment. All of a sudden, you smell ozone. It smells like a mountain met in the spring. Just beautiful. And Golden, of course, has a brewery in it, so it was a bit strong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a pleasant, very pleasant change. So the, the next thing was to see, well, how big an area can we affect? And so we took ten of these harmonizers and made ten tapes and distributed those along the front range corridor <coughs> up from the mountains a little ways. Interstate 25, uh, Colorado Springs to Fort Collins, uh, 140 miles, 60 miles, something like that. And we played the ten tapes simultaneously for one hour on a given signal. And later in the evening, and then for the next four days, <coughs> there was absolutely not a speck of air pollution visible. The air was perfectly clear. Uh, the weatherman at noon on Saturday was so excited, he said, it's so clear you can see Utah. <laughs> I mean, he was really excited. And that was a result of this energy work. Well, we created a, a huge dome of clean air. I mean, Denver used to be the top, you know, it was number 10 on top of the list. And uh, even though that I think it was off the list for a short time, or down on the list a little bit out of first place. <coughs> Uh, it's completely off the list of included cities now. Uh, and we have had a continuing program uh, of working with this, trying to 
figure out better ways to do it and uh, hopefully make a buck at it uh, you know, from the local EPA or local government. If mm -hmm. we are not successful in that, we will continue with the program, but it's going to take the diligence and application of everybody out here uh, to work with it and knock out pollution in your area. So we we have two concepts that we do a centralized control system uh, where we can put specific frequencies in to take out specific pollutants and have a essentially a radio control signal uh, system and an automatic sampling system using the uh, infrared analyzer <coughs> and be able to sample from a high place entire LA basin for instance. Uh, we could do that quite easily and then put precisely the signal in required to reduce the uh, pollution to zero or you know, to a very tolerable level. Do you have any documentation that specific pollutants are being reduced? Uh, in Phoenix currently and in Denver the carbon monoxide readings are uh, six to ten parts per million, uh, down from 150 to 200. You know, in the hazardous range. And so you've got something going uh, like Ozone Phoenix is too. now down in Phoenix to the good range, <coughs> 25, 35 parts. Uh, Mexico City, incidentally, is down. We've been working there for about three weeks now, and we're seeing a significant reduction. Actually, no, it's been, been a month. We got through the 15th of last month. Yeah. Uh, it, it wasn't as bad as what we experienced in Cairo in January. Cairo was... Really? I mean, it made your eyes water. I mean, it, it was searing. I like to say to take the hair off a buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an ancient city. It's a minimum of 10,000 years old. It was a huge <laughs> population, which probably hasn't changed that much in five or 10,000 years. Uh, the only difference is the amount of traffic. Now we have diesel and gasoline and chemical and oil refineries and all that stuff. But the, the stink of that ancient city was just for now. And after we got our equipment set up, 48 hours later, there was a fresh breeze blowing and uh, you know, what we could see was no pollution over the city. Where did the pollutants go? Fall down? Disappear? Well, that's why we're seeking some funding uh, or to get paid for doing the work under contract. Uh, to get a, this infrared analyzer because that will let us know exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. We have a before and an after and we can go in by the molecular weights mm -hmm. of what's present afterwards and figure out what happened to it. What I suspect happens, and, and this is purely speculation, is that the carbon monoxide transmutes. Mm -hmm. There's an actual transmutation to nitrogen, which is a normal component of the air. Mm -hmm. And we know that uh, through the work of Louis Curbran out of France that uh, biological transmutations occur and that they occur in nature in geologic formations. But let, let's imagine, and I'll try to illustrate this. Let's say this is a nitrogen molecule, <coughs> and it transmutes. Uh, I'm going to use a little different symbolism to uh, oxygen and carbon. Let's say that these volumes or weights equal this volume of weight. Okay, uh, whatever the, mole the MW molecular weight 
of nitrogen is equal to the molecular weight combined of carbon and oxygen. So what happens, it would be like if this was a balloon full of water and you kind of pinched off a corner of it and gave it a twist, you'd have two, not two balloons, still one balloon, but there's a twist to them with a slightly different uh, configuration. So if we do this in terms of resonance, let's say we start shaking this balloon real hard and we give it a real twist like that and it converts to something that looks like this, it's the same thing but it's called carbon monoxide. So it's through resonance that we can change this, we can untwist this and not shake it and return it to this form. Okay, that's real esoteric physics, but I think that's what's happening. And with that machine, you'd be able to know exactly? Yeah, the uh, infrared signature on nitrogen, uh, let, let's say that this is the infrared signature of nitrogen, and it looks like this, and maybe this is the infrared signature of uh, carbon monoxide. We can read that precisely. Uh, the same thing would happen with uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, probably some of the hydrocarbons, nitrous oxide definitely is going to shift into something else. We don't know what it is. We really need to know what exactly is happening. So we're uh, we're seeking funding initially for a $20,000 infrared analyzer and then eventually uh, if somebody really gets interested in the work, uh, the state-of-the-art unit is uh, going to cost us roughly a half million to purchase and set up with its whole array of computers and whatnot. Additional amount for computer backup equipment and broadcasting equipment to send that signal out to the uh, harmonizer units out in the field. Are so you talking about like a million dollars? A million would be a good start, right. and uh, uh, something more like in the nature of three to five. <laughs> And then as we get into servicing city regions, uh, the company would you know, generate an income coming back. Uh, service program, setting up the equipment uh, would cost, a, say the LA city region would cost them somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 30 million. Uh, the health care savings alone would probably amount to Five or six hundred million a year. You said crime. Um, yes. yes, crime. Uh, what we found is that the crime rate has gone down. Uh, in Denver, it's currently down 50 percent from what it was three years ago when we started working. Wow, that alone, besides health, you know, yeah. Health. Yeah, besides health. Mm -hmm. Is that from doing that? Running harmonizers? Yeah. yeah. Are they the still running? Air pollution. Yes. Yeah. This is the question I wanted to ask: Was how long? Do you, how long do you run them, or what intervals do you run them? I would I would suggest an hour or two in the morning and evening. You know, just sunrise. Just those small ones. Sunrise, sunset. Mm -hmm. That'll cover roughly a 15 mile radius. Mm -hmm. You say you don't know exactly what it's being converted into, but what are some of the effects that you've noticed in the environment? Well, it just gets clear. There, there's not as much brown particulate stuff out there. And even the haze that results after you do this work, even the haze, it seems like you can see through it more. There isn't that staticky fuzz to it. Does it only affect the atmosphere or does it affect the soil and the water? I suspect 
uh, knowing what we know about gravity. Well, let me put a proposition to you. If, if you drop uh, something here at surface level, it hits the floor. Uh, let's, let's say you're five miles down in the uh, depths of the Durban Deep Gold Mines in South Africa. If you drop something, does it hit the floor? <laughs> I don't know. Ask, ask the miner that dropped his <laughs> head. What? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it hits the floor. Gravity is working through five miles of rock. Okay. These devices uh, produce what can be termed a tensor or gravity field effect. Consequently, if we're creating a sphere of a 15 mile radius from the surface, this is 15 miles and this is 15 miles, uh, this is rock, and you've got various layers here of sedimentary rocks and uh, aquifers and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I, I have no proof of this at the moment. I can only hope and speculate that this will help clean up the aquifers and soils. The first evidence we have of that is the increase in the soil organisms in the cornfield in Iowa. Uh, the numbers of worms and beneficial insects in those fields is up dramatically. Uh, consequently, there's been a reduction in the amount of uh, toxic residues from uh, pesticides used in the past and from the fertilizers, uh, particularly the phosphates and nitrates that are used. Uh, <clears throat> in Iowa, starting two years ago, we put a, one of the larger agricultural harmonizers on a farm there. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. We have been using the swept clear tape there. And, the, uh, the farmer turns it on in the morning and in the evening for about an hour, maybe two. And uh, uh, the first year they had an infestation of the uh, corn borer miller. It would be like a cutworm miller. A little critter here, you know, he's got his life to live and all that sort of thing. <laughs> but uh, it makes it awful hard on corn because the, the corn stalk, they bore into the axle of the leaf right in here and weaken it and then it, the ear falls down or falls off uh, before the corn is ripe. Well, he, uh, his corn borer gauge is his window screen. Uh, the wall of the house here and he's got his eaves out in a, a lamp. And, uh, eaves. And the millers were just all over the streams. You couldn't, couldn't see out the stream for the millers. And uh, when he started using this, within 24 hours, uh, instead of being the five or six hundred millers on the side of the house or on the stream, you could see five or six. They're gone. They left the area. And somewhere else to do the dirty work. <laughs> or uh, succumbed, I, I don't know which. I, I have no idea. <laughs> now, I remember reading your article, and I remember it saying at the end of the period of time, um, the corn stalk hips had only like one or two, and the other three counties, or four counties actually had uh, 8 to 10. Right. I was interested because I'm from Iowa and I read it to all my relatives who are still right. farmers back there. And uh, they wanted to know 
uh, was it the, did the he play at the whole uh, growing period? The whole season, yes. Whole season, and then upon uh, harvesting time, is that when they found that they had such a better quality of corn and, and uh, oh, didn't no. lose and they didn't have to spray? And no, they no, they didn't some spray. Well, he checked it during the season and he couldn't see any evidence of borers. Mm -hmm. So he elected not to do some of the practices that his neighbors were doing. Uh, who hadn't any reference point. I mean, mm -hmm. they were getting damaged, so they sprayed. Mm -hmm. Or they were being encouraged to by the local ag service. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> last year, mm -hmm. well, the other thing that happened, that fall, the side of his house was covered with ladybugs. He had not seen a ladybug in that area in 30 years. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the whole side of the house is just bright yellow with or bright orange with ladybugs. You know, neighbors would drive by and say, when did you paint the house? <laughs> it was ladybugs. Well, I, I happen to know that that particular insect winters in the high mountains where a certain type of energy is present in the rocks. Yeah. Uh, here in California, uh, famous for the, the ladybug rocks, they go up and scoop them up in bags and haul them down and keep them over winter. Oh. And uh, that's the, the orgone, so-called orgone energy of right. And that's and it's visible, uh, and you don't have to have a trained eye. You just go up on those peaks in the, in the fall, in the evening, after dark, and you can see the pulsating blue band of energy above the rocks where these insects hang out. So apparently that same energy was really permeating the house, and those insects gathered there and just really really like them, crowded in the area. You know, last year, they had a perfect corn growing season. <coughs> Same program, no morning and evening, an hour or two. And a, a good year is 140 bushel corn. A really, really good year is 160 bushel maybe. Last year, they had 190 bushel. <sighs> First time in history. No fertilizer, no sprays, no change in the program except that one item. So it increases that light energy in the area. Okay, that means that the toxic elements are absent or being transmuted in the soil. So you have a higher population of beneficial organisms. And uh, I think I'm going to get some well tests from the local area this year. Uh, get those back from Monty, and we'll see if your, your groundwater is at you know, 100 feet have been improved. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then we definitely can make a major difference. Yes, uh, I spent some time in um, Benhorn, and I'm sure a lot of people aware of the way I've been part of the Scotland. And they were having financial difficulties that they needed to bring in for a particular project. And everyone who was there decided to picture a block like a, like a cloud. Just have it removed and picture golden light of gold actually raying right through. And I was just wondering if we might sleep on it and <laughs> and perhaps all of us do at least one meditation together on bringing this money that's from me. And uh, then what we did after that was at 9 o'clock at night for three months, we just simply uh, noticed it was 9 o'clock at night and just for one minute pictured that same vision again and they got the heart of <laughs> and we asked for it. <laughs> and on top of it, it wasn't all coming to soul. There were things where people came and they uh, donated time and uh, also equipment that they didn't even know they needed at the time. So I would put that out as a suggestion. 
Thank you. Um, at my first meeting there at Grunwald was with the group, uh, there were a couple of ladies from Finhorn present, and uh, I owe them a great favor because they sent me a copy of Peter Caddy's book. So thank you for reminding me. And, uh, I, I need to return that favor. Um, some of the neat effects uh, I've covered that I think <coughs> about finished up for the evening program here and uh, I, I just wanted to bring up some of these wonderful effects that some of the associates have noticed and uh, some of the effects that we've discovered ourselves. Uh, again, this is a research association. Uh, nobody has a bona fide paid up membership. Uh, we have a lot of contributors uh, who help support the work uh, by the purchase of the tools. And that's kept us going for um, five years now since the original discovery of the rings. And uh, we've trained probably, at this point, I think we've trained around 800 people to do the geopathic work and to uh, you know, at least get acquainted with the tools and begin to use them. So the network is fairly large. Uh, it's international now. We have contacts in England, Germany, France, Spain, and we're getting good reports back from overseas. Uh, now a few in Mexico, and uh, uh, made a contact in Canada and Toronto just uh, three weeks ago that uh, may take not only the tools in there, but also the air pollution work. Got a, as soon as I got done with the conference, there was an article in the paper about how nasty the pollution is in Toronto. So I'm sure that gentleman will be very pleased to experiment. Uh, he has a little environmental remediation company, and his son is connected with uh, the major environmental company in, in Brussels. So I, I know that we're being noticed and talked about. And I, I want to remind you all that no matter what you heard before you came here from anybody, that a little bit of everything you hear is true. <laughs> Good ending. <laughs> and again, I want to thank Christanne and, and Dorothy for the organization and the putting together, and I don't need to neglect Jim, because I know he's had a big, minor, big minor. hand. Don't believe everything you hear. <laughs> so, thank you again for coming, and I hope to see many of you tomorrow. This morning we're going to cover the, what I consider the most fundamental aspect of subtle energy, and that's the Earth grid, or the geopathic stress zones, and I use the term geopathic stress generically. Uh, there's many, many, many different uh, geopathic stress zones, and we can identify them as Hartman grid, uh, Curry grid, uh, what I call the actual geopathic zone, uh, personal zones, uh, communication zones, uh, anything that you can think of can have a subtle energy that will act in a geopathic fashion or will create a pathology or interruption or chaos in some aspect of your life. So the 
geopathic stress is something that's very easily remedied. Uh, you locate it by dowsing uh, with L rods or willow switch or pendulum or just by feeling it with your hands. And there's, there's many ways to detect it. Uh, I choose the dowsing rods, the uh, simple L rods, which can be of any material. It can be wood, plastic, uh, glass, uh, stem of grass, uh, a branch, anything will work. So there's no magic to these. It's just that it's very cheap, very convenient, and it gives a good visual demonstration of the presence of geopathic stress. And to demonstrate that, I'll just walk along the side here. And I'll locate a geopathic stress line, which is coming in from my right. And the uh, energy field, as I come into it, uh, approach the zone, the rods will begin to open. And as I get exactly on that one inch center line of the zone, uh, they'll lock. They'll be fully open at right angles to their original alignment. And they will literally lock onto that position. I'm going to look for one I call the geopathic stress line. Just hold your geopathic zone in line. And as that zone is approached, center line grabs the rod surface and it's in perfect alignment. As I step back slightly, the tips want to move forward again. And as I move forward, they want to move backwards. So I literally lock on that center line. So it's very how did you ascertain that they're coming from your right? Uh, I just simply set that program in my mind. Yeah, I only want to have to deal with those which are coming into the house. So if you go around the house, we only pick up those that are coming into it, not those that are exiting. The same line over here would be exiting the house, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't read on the rods. That's just the way you program your own mind. Okay, so that's you. Your mind is out here in your bio field somewhere at some distance. It's a network uh, of great complexity and great geometry. Uh, your mind is not in the brain. The brain is a uh, piece of meat that acts like a uh, switchboard, essentially, or a recognition panel for uh, these various energies whether it's light, sound, or the subtle energy. So, this line, then, can be blocked very simply. And what I'll do here is to locate exactly the spot on the wall, right there at the corner of that brick, and use the rods just by placing them here. Yeah. Slim, do you need to leave those rods there? Yes, they're firm. So if you remove the rods, why the that magnetic that line's going to come back? Yes, I see. Yeah, they they become a, a permanent acupuncture needle. I see. And I'll show you how that works. When you go outside. And has the line just gone down below or up above to? Yeah, it's just them? being vertical over and, and down. Just like you throw a rock in the river. It's very, very simple. It's clairvoyance. You can see those energies. That's what they see. They see the energies going through it like this. Now, why it works that way, I don't know. All I know is that it does work. <laughs> so, 
Uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave that to the bean counters and uh, theoretical quantum physicists to figure it out. Uh, we're, we're only interested in the practical aspects of it. You know, how to help ourselves, help our families and our friends. And for some of you, I'm sure that uh, it can become a, at least a part-time business to add a little income to your cash flow and be of service. Uh, we started this, oh gosh, in 85. Uh, Bill Reed and I were partnered up in a little fix-it handyman business. And I mentioned the story yesterday about the gal who had the uh, chronic migraine, and she uh, uh, was cured of that malady. And uh, <coughs> as we look back on that over the past 12, 13 years, uh, we still marvel at the simplicity of what we did and how well it worked for her. Then we went on and began doing the same service for others that we run into in our business. And we found that you know, all sorts of physical maladies could be alleviated if not uh, completely removed. Uh, I think our next case was a, uh, an area where there were a lot of the men were having heart attacks. As a matter of fact, one gentleman uh, actually died during the time we were working in that area. And we didn't have the opportunity to do this home. Although I, I knew him, and he showed no signs of heart problems. I mean, he just was a healthy, uh, happy guy. And boom, all of a sudden, went down with a heart attack. But we did do several other homes in the neighborhood. And the gentleman in question all reported a relief from this contraction they were having and the heart problems that they'd suffered for years. So, uh, and I personally experienced uh, a very local phenomenon uh, when I slept in the bed where a person had died of a heart attack. And when I woke up in the morning, my heart was in spasm. I was in a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty, and uh, so the next night I just changed ends in bed. I slept in the other way, and I didn't have the same symptoms. Uh, symptoms relieved later in the day by you know, a couple hours later, I didn't have a problem. But by dowsing the spot, I found right there under where my heart was position that there was a cross. So it, it's very real to me. And, and those of you who have, may have other difficulties or symptoms, or even a generalized kind of malaise, you just don't feel good, you and uh, this kind of stuff. By taking the geopathic stress out, your overall health and well-being will improve. We have a lot of recent cases right here in California where that's proved to be true. Uh, Dorothy's neighbor uh, was down with, I don't know, some cancer, just didn't feel good, or combination things. Uh, she'd been bedridden, as a matter of fact, and after they did the geopathic films, uh, she's been up and awake and bright and healthy and you know, really made a dramatic recovery. In the so this is the kind of thing that can happen. Uh, it won't happen in every case, but probably 95, maybe 95%, maybe 98% uh, you'll get to use. What about, uh, I'm thinking of my mother right now. It's like she's had the same problem of wherever she's lived. You know, she lived in Texas, and then and this, and now she's in Mississippi. But she's having the same... Can you comment on that? Or? Well, uh, 
the condition may have, as you say, locked in. Mm -hmm. It may have become almost a solid mass of energy, a pattern that holds you. It doesn't break up when you get out of the causative pattern. And it, it's almost enough just to sidestep quickly. That's, that's how all these, these subtle things work. 
All right, today we're presenting the concept of geobiology, which means uh, life on Earth, okay. biology of the Earth. And uh, the plants, the animals, uh, us, uh, birds, creepy crawlies, uh, everything can be considered biological organisms. through these various energy fields that we're not ordinarily aware of, unless we happen to be clairvoyant. And I'm going to break here and go back to Lola's question. Oh, I wanted to, to know, do you go from left to right, or to right to left, or what sense are you looking <coughs> for, for the... the Over here on the yeah, South, west, uh, just walking. Geopathic zones can run at any angle. Yeah, I mean, they can come from anywhere, go to anywhere. So you can have this network that will be very skewed. But you'll have one going this way and another one coming back this way. Oh. Mm -hmm. so, so that that's how they work. So if you looked at it globally and saw the, the web of the geopathic zones, they wouldn't all be coming this way and this way? No. They start at many different points and go any direction? Well, they, for the most part, and I'll get into that uh, here in a little bit, how our concept is. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. But our, at least our concept is something we can work with. That's a verbal, visual. These again are vertical walls or planes of energy that intersect. And I have a couple of pictures in here that may help to more accurately define that for your the way you can perceive it. So the geopathic zone could just start and start flowing we and then stop? We did find uh, in Mexico City, we did find one that started at a point and went across the city. It happened to be right at the foot of a volcano. Uh, in the Zalpon area of Mexico City. So we can start anywhere, but does it have to be sort of a specific place like like a fault or a volcano? Volcano or a spring or something where they might start to appear. As I de as I define geopathic mm -hmm. zones, they are associated with faults, fissures, cracks, water veins, etc. The Hartman grid is entirely something else. We don't know what the origin of that may be. It's not necessarily related to a geologic structure. So the concept of Geobiology is uh, developed in Europe, <coughs> and uh, we read the little book uh, mentioned in the bibliography here, uh, Points of Cosmic Energy by uh, Blanche Merz, a uh, brilliant woman who has been a dowager and researcher, and I re highly recommend reading the book. She presents a, a wonderful, wonderful picture of the heart and the grid and other energy points and interactions. Did you start the energy? And the energy points of cosmic energy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's listed there in the Oh it is? In the oh, okay. Yeah, unfortunately our workbook is uh, written about three years ago. And uh, we don't, I mean, we've gone a couple of light years past all of the information presented there now. And I uh, really want to get some better graphics and uh, <coughs> uh, perhaps a little more coherent presentation so that uh, as you refer back to it, the, the workshop is very uh, real to you proper sequence. So, in our <coughs> presentation here today, I'm going to have to do these one at a time to the narrowness of the shelf here. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to go into some of the history uh, the theory as best we can present it. Uh, and how we can apply this information. And then we'll do some actual field work uh, this afternoon. Go out here in the side yard. And we'll actually do this home as a demonstration. And as a thank you to our hosts for letting us have the, the place here. Uh, at the end of the program on Sunday, uh, we'll provide a certificate. Uh, it probably doesn't mean much except that you've been here and done that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can tell you now that uh, by the time Today is over. At the end of today's program, you will know a thousand times more than Bill Reed and I did when we started doing geopathic work. I mean, we were complete novices. We'd only heard the word geopathic stress, no concept of what it was. I had no idea how prevalent it might be, how frequently that phenomenon might show up or anything about it. And as we've worked over the past 12 years, we found that it's everywhere with very, very few exceptions. The exceptions have been seven locations in the Denver area that we found that do not have any geographic stress of any kind. They're just blank spots in the grid. And we didn't have time to map the whole thing. We just checked quickly for geopathic stress. No problem. Okay, divide. Job done. So the certification will mean that uh, you can actually find the zones and work with those energies. You know how to bend the rods, put them in the ground, locate the zones, and block the energies, and then recheck. And then it'll be up to you over the next several months to do some practice. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks would be sufficient if you have that time. Go find somebody who has got a problem. You know, find the problem, fix it. Do the geopathic zones and then check back with them every few days to see how they're doing. And see if a major change does indeed occur. Uh, I'll almost guarantee that in 98% of the cases you'll be successful. Now the one or two or ten percent that don't improve, uh, something else is very, very wrong. And I don't, I don't necessarily know what that is. You come down to find that parasites are probably always associated with geopathic stress after a period of time. Uh, a parasitic condition will come up. And <clears throat> help them get rid of the parasites by whatever means. And then everything really works well. But those will be fairly few in number of parasites for major consideration. adopted the term geobiology, and uh, that kind of replaces the old uh, term geomancy. I've looked in the dictionaries, I've looked for it under you know, topic headings. I can't find a definition of geomancy. <laughs> Nothing that satisfies me. Webster said it was the art of discovering lines. Okay. <laughs> draw a line on the wall, I don't know. But it was so incomplete <coughs> that uh, it, it, it didn't make any sense to me. Uh, it probably uh, would be defined today, but not directly. Uh, as we go through this process, you could say, well, I'm learning to do geomancy. 